Thank you, Miss Tammy. We appreciate it. That sounded a little bit like that old uh, commercial. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. Anybody remember that one? I don't even remember what it was for. Was it cars? Automotive work or plumbing or something? I don't know. All right. Make VBS a matter of your prayers, please. Uh, we do need all the help we can get, and so we will, uh, we will take all the help we can get as well. Uh, if you think there's nothing you can do, well, there's probably something you can do, so uh, ask Tammy what that might be. Then uh, let me remind you of a couple of things. This Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, we have our crawfish boil coming up. If you love crawfish, you're in luck, as they like to say over in John Calvin's ways. Um, there's going to be a lot of it. If you don't care one thing or another about crawfish, but you like a burger or a dog, well, that you're, you're still going to be just fine. And if you just like to visit and circulate, well, come on, we got lots of that. And if you're real adventurous and you want to take a run at a bouncy house, we're going to have some of those too, I think. So, But uh, that's mostly for the kids. We have had to pull a few adults out before. We have some LEO on site for that. I'm kidding, of course. But uh, it'll be a fun time. Invite folks and uh, sign up for it. And, uh, so we'll have a good or a decent uh, guesstimate about how many to provide for. The next Sunday after that, not this Sunday, but the next one will be our graduating high school senior recognition Sunday and they're going to have a luncheon for them as well and then uh, once we get to that then it'll be May and you can turn around and we'll be at 14 graduations and then at VBS so um, be in prayer for all of those things coming up let me mention some prayer needs that I know about um, just going to list off a number of folks who have been injured and are recovering from that. Uh, all are recovering well at this point, so that would be Harry Gibson and Jeanette Ballard and Jane Newton and Linda Beatty. Um, so continue to pray for them. Uh, two folks had pacemakers installed in the recent past. One of those is Bob uh, Cawthorn, and I'll come back to the Cawthorns in just a second, and the other is Gene Rogers. And so um, be in prayer for, for those folks. Um, Maggie McDonald and Tim Thompson both had stents uh, in their, put in their, um, in for heart issues and uh, be praying for them to recover and to do well after that. Um, several with ongoing cancer and other, other things. Uh, Gerald Nelly, John Ravel's dad, uh, Cecil, all recovering and, and, having, and having ongoing treatments as well, so I uh, pray for those folks. And then uh, Bob and Judy, I heard late last night, were accepted into the assisted living at Castlewoods, which will help them stay together, uh, which is a very good thing. There are some details to be worked out, one of which is if you are able-bodied or know someone who can help next Tuesday, the sons-in-law are, law are going to be uh, moving a few things in for them, uh, some bedroom and, and, and a little bit of uh, sitting room and kitchen area stuff too, not, not very much that, uh, it's a small apartment, so not moving the house in, but, um, if you know of someone who could help or you yourself could help, it would be greatly appreciated. You can talk to me and I can get you in touch with the folks who you need to talk to. Or if you've got good ideas about it, tell me about that too. Um, and then uh, let's remember our folks in long-term care, Dot Sillers, Dr. Andy Brown, Miss Mary Neal, uh, all at the Orchards Nursing Care unit and then um, 
There are a number of expectant mothers within our congregation and as extended family members of our congregation. So uh, Rich and Jane's daughter-in-law, Katie Sutton, uh, Sarah Durham, married to Wills or James, however you know him. Uh, Katie Runyon had an appointment today and had some pretty elevated blood pressure, but it came back down into the normal range uh, relatively quickly and they, they don't think there's anything in particular to keep her for, but are, uh, are going to continue watching that. Uh, Lexi Welch, uh, the, other, <laughs> the, the other side of the Welch uh, twosome that's coming. Uh, Marguerite, Sarah Cody due in September, Susan uh, Atkinson Ferris uh, due July 8th. And then Betty Cash told me her son David and his wife Gina are expecting twin girls at the end of August, the first part of September. So your prayers should really go out for them. That sounds drastic. I'm sure it'll be a lot of fun for young people. Whew. All right, so we'll be praying for all of these. What prayer needs? I would remind you to keep praying for the Covenant Presbyterian Church and the Covenant School at Nashville and for Rolling Fork and Silver City and all the other areas that have uh, had such great damage from tornadoes and all the disaster relief that's going on. I think the PCA uh, disaster relief guys have put in about a dozen uh, sheds of hope so people can store things until their housing is livable again. Um, and there are, that is just one of many, 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 many things that are happening up there to, to help out and, and, relief, and for relief, disaster relief. What prayer requests, that was good, do y'all have? All right, this will be quick. Very good. I know that there will be things that are left unsaid in a room this size, so pray for your neighbor, because most likely they need it. Let's, uh, let's take all of these things to the Lord in prayer. Our God and our King, we do come before you with praises in our hearts. Uh, we want to come before you as people who are not uh, overly haughty or proud of ourselves, who don't think too highly of ourselves, but instead, Lord, we want to come before you as those who are, um, who, who are well aware that we are dependent on you, that we don't live independent lives, we don't have a single thing, a single breath, a single anything that uh, did not come from you. And so we love you for that. We, we put our hope in you because of that, today and forever. Oh Lord, we pray with great hope because we know that you can uh, answer our prayers. You can answer our prayers on behalf of those who are hurting. And we think of all of these with injuries and surgeries and healing bones and pray, Lord, that they would heal well. We think of those who are experiencing uh, some form of cancer and the treatment thereof. We pray, Lord, that in your mighty power you might uh, reach down and, uh, and tend to their needs, that you might make them whole again. Lord, that as you will, we, we know that you're able. We pray for those who have been suffering with uh, issues of heart heart problems and uh, Jean and Bob and Maggie and Tim and pray Lord for uh, for each of them that they may uh, come back to good health that they may have uh, curative help from all of their treatments and from you we pray for our um, our expectant moms we are looking forward so much to to meeting these new little ones who you are adding these blessings who you are giving to these families and so, Lord, it is with a great anticipation that we await, but we pray in the meantime that you would keep moms and babies healthy and 
that you would prepare them for uh, for all that is coming. Lord, may you um, may you keep them whole and well, and at the right time bring them uh, forth to be uh, to be seen and recognized and heard and, and loved and enjoyed. And, and Lord, may they put their hope and trust in you, and may their parents lead them in that direction. Lord, we uh, pray for the ministries of the church. Uh, we think of all the upcoming events, fun things and exciting things. And, and um, we pray, Lord, for, uh, for your grace and mercy on us at Lakeland. We pray, Lord, that your people will uh, enjoy the fellowship that's, uh, that is available that, Lord, we might uh, bring in friends and, and family members and co-workers and neighbors and, uh, Lord, as, a, as, an introduction to, as an introduction to your people and to the faith. Lord, may you uh, add to our number through, through all of these things so that they, too, may be followers of yours and disciples of yours. We pray that tonight, Lord, as we think more about... Uh, the Apostles' Creed, and all that we confess each week. May you teach us tonight through Steve's lesson and through your word, and may we be convinced and convicted, and uh, may we be satisfied with our profession as we make it each Sunday, knowing more about what it means. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to look at something out of that passage in a minute, but before we do, um, just a question, uh, first of all, just kind of a housekeeping question, how many of you plan to uh, show up at least for a little bit of the crawfish bowl this, this weekend. Good, 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 good. Um, next question I have is, how many of you show of hands? Oh, by the way, if you need a, if you need a lesson, raise your hand uh, you know, or something to write with. We'll be glad to provide. Uh, forgot to ask that. Uh, okay, how many of you know who G. Gordon Liddy is? Okay, what, what do you associate with his name? Okay, what what was his role in Watergate? Anyone, did anything happen to him because of Watergate? Yeah, do you remember what he did after he got out of prison? Yeah, talk show host, um, pretty popular talk show host, and also uh, played in some in some TV dramas uh, too. Uh, George Gordon Liddy. He was general counsel for the committee to reelect Richard Milhouse Nixon. Uh, he both planned and supervised the Watergate break-in, and he was convicted of conspiracy on the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters, spent four and a half years in federal prison. Um, anyone know if he's dead or living now? He, he, he died at, in 2021, um, and he wanted it to be known. <laughs> One of his last requests was, please let it be published. I did not die from COVID-related death uh, situation. Uh, he wanted to make sure about that. He, he died at age 90 from complications with Parkinson's. Now, before he went on trial, during the time before he was convicted, he went on trial, but the word was out in the street that he would... Uh, be convicted. He appeared on as a guest on David Letterman. Now, I don't know what you thought about David Letterman, but I will tell you this. Uh, what I did appreciate about him was that he would have guests on his show that he did not agree with. His show was not primarily a, an arm of propaganda, but he would have people on he didn't agree with. He even had 
Paul McCartney on one time, he asked Paul McCartney, why have you never been on my show before? He says, because I don't like you. And Letterman just laughed. You know, he, he, he knew how to take it. But in the middle of a conversation with Letterman, as, as Letterman was known to do, he, uh, he would be, you know, questioning this way and making light conversation. Then all of a sudden he'd switch gears. Letterman switched gears, and just out of the blue, he asked G. Gordon Liddy, he says, so what happens after we die? And Liddy said, we're food for worms. And Letterman said, that's it? Liddy said, yep, that's it. Now I'm going to read um, an excerpt from his book, Gordon Liddy's book, G. Gordon Liddy's book entitled Will, uh, from years after while in prison, uh, he did make a profession of faith in Christ under the ministry of Chuck Colson. And um, this is what he recalls. I quote, After my appearance on Letterman, my flippant answer haunted me and for all I know may have been what God used to put me on the road to my conversion to Christianity. It's like as soon as I said what I said, I knew deep down I didn't really believe what I just said. Isn't that interesting? Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has placed eternity in our hearts. So we instinctively know that there's something beyond the grave, but what? You know, the creed mentions resurrection twice. One is on the third day he, speaking of Jesus, rose again. And then toward the end, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And next week we're going to do the life everlasting. We're we'll also cover what it means to say amen. But the second mention of resurrection of the creed affirms that everybody who dies, everybody will be one day resurrected. But so what? I remember I had a professor, drove me insane in college, just about, um, because he was such a blatant unbeliever. And I said, you do know that the resurrection is a historical, provable fact, don't you? You know what he said? He said, so what? That just proves in a chance universe anything can happen. It's not what the Bible says. Because, and this is the first double asterisk here, and that's this. Jesus' resurrection was not an anomaly. It's not something weird that happened just once. It's not an anomaly, A-N-O-M-A-L-Y, but a starter pistol. Not an anomaly, but a starter pistol. Because Jesus leads us through what seemed to be the locked door of death and the grave into bodily resurrection. So we're going to ask three one-word questions about the resurrection from the dead. And the first one is this. What? Uh, reunited, relocated, but how do we know this happened? You know, the resurrection from the dead, our soul, which upon death goes immediately to be with the Lord, immediately. Our soul is reunited with our bodies and then relocated in the resurrection to another place. And there's two bullet points here, and that's this. How do we know? First of all, we know historically. Historically. 1 Corinthians 15. Read with me. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 3. For I received, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now notice. And then that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last he appeared to me also as of one abnormally born. One of the best definitions I ever heard of history. What is history? It's this. It's a knowledge of the past based on testimony. 
How do we know that picture in the history book is a picture of Abraham Lincoln or Adolf Hitler or George Washington? We know because of the testimony of someone in the past who testified, yes, that is who that is. So, so you know, what is history? It's a knowledge of the past based on testimony. Historically, we know. That's a lot of testimony there. It wasn't just a few people. It was as many as 500 at one time. We know it happened. But the second bullet point is this. We know personally, we know historically, from 1 Corinthians 15, we know personally because it has already happened to us spiritually. We know personally because it has already happened to us spiritually. In our spiritual autobiography, which is written in Ephesians 2, verse 1, it says, You were dead in trespasses and sins. And Jesus even says, and this is a fascinating passage. Let me just read it to you. You won't have to turn there. Uh, but let me just read to you how Jesus describes conversion. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting. In John 5, uh, 24, he says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Listen, he has crossed over from death to life. In other words, our, our conversion is a spiritual resurrection from the dead. And that is why in Revelation 21, verse 8, the, the, the second death has no power over us. And what is the second death? Well, that's what happens to those who have neglected Jesus. So we know historically resurrection happened. We know personally because it's already happened to us spiritually. We've undergone a spiritual resurrection, which is a sure sign that we will one day undergo a physical resurrection. Second question is this, how? How does the Bible describe the relationship between our mortal bodies and our resurrected bodies? And in scripture, this is how it's described with an analogy. The analogy is this, it is between a seed and a plant. Between a seed and a plant. It's a picture, this next statement, of both discontinuity and continuity. It's a picture of both discontinuity and continuity. In other words, it is the same but different. We see that all the time. If you see a baby picture of me, a picture of me in the third grade, a picture of me in college, and a picture of me now, I'm the same person, but I'm different. There's, a, there, there's continuity, but there's discontinuity between me and that little baby in the crib years ago. And notice here, uh, if you'll go on down now to 1 Corinthians 15, um, verse 42. It says, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. You see, it's, a, it's the same body, it's just in a different way. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So, what you have is this continuity. It's still a body. But it's a different body. Like two bullet points there. First one is this. A plant is different from a seed. A plant is different from a seed. You know, a pumpkin seed and a pumpkin plant, a corn seed, a stalk of corn, um, a wheat seed and a stalk of wheat, uh, a, a seed for a pea and peas, they're different. The plant is different from the seed, and it's different in this way. Second bullet point. A plant is the realization of the seed. It is the fulfillment of the seed's promise. It's one reason why we call springtime 
a time of promise because it's a time where you plant things. Because you plant seeds in the promise that that seed, the fulfillment of that seed's promise, you drop that seed into the ground uh, with a promise that you will have a plant growing out of that ground. A plant is the realization of the seed, the fulfillment of the seed's promise. In other words, our resurrected bodies will be the full realization of what God intends our bodies to be. Are our bodies right now what God intends them to be? No, but they will be fully realized, our resurrected bodies in the resurrection. And by the way, anytime someone tells you you, you can live your best life now, uh, biblically, that is wrong. It's just not true. You can never live your best life now. You will live your best life after the resurrection. So how does the Christian view of death change our view of burials and graveyards? Let me explain it this way. The Christian view of death and resurrection transforms our attitudes towards death and sets the Christian perspective of death apart from the perspective of the world. Uh, from the perspective of this fallen world, that is, if you leave God out of the picture, you know what burial is? It, it's a waste disposal strategy. That's what it is. In countries that are particularly pagan, they're figuring out now how to best dispose of dead bodies. And they call it disposing of the bodies. And, but even our traditional funeral services puts it, and I'm quoting from one of them, disposing reverently of their earthly remains. So there's still this idea uh, of disposal, but that's not biblical because the resurrection of Jesus holds out an alternative hope. And that is that a burial will be less like a waste disposal ceremony and here's what a burial is. It is a seed planting ceremony. That's what a burial is. I used to laugh at my dad. I thought he was being kind of mean when he'd say, when he's doing a funeral on peace and go plant somebody. He used to tell me that. Now I don't think he's being mean. He, he was serious because a burial is the planting, the planting of that seed. Imagine for a moment an alien visiting our world. Okay, E.T. comes to do some research. And he observes our waste manage management strategies. What do we do? We bury stuff. But then E.T. goes and visits a farm. And he observes a, a farmer burying tiny little round things in the ground. E.T. sees this plow digging up these, these tiny graves. And into those graves, the farmer drops the seed and covers the seed with dirt. Now, E.T. is going to think the farmer is in the waste management business but in fact, in fact, as E.T. observes, the farmer's field is not a vast cemetery. And the farmer is not a serial killer, even if you spell it C-E-R-E-A-L. The farmer is not a killer. The field is not a graveyard. And the job is not waste disposal. The field is not a cemetery. The field, hear this, a graveyard is a life field. A life field. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, we'll see that in a moment, the first to rise when Jesus comes will not be us if we're still on the earth, but those who are in the grave. It is a life field. The farmer does not sow in despair, but in hope that the seeds will rise, and they will rise transformed. In the resurrection of Jesus, we see this. The first crop has shot up out of the ground. The first fruit is on the tree. The harvest is on the way. So that's the what and the how. Third question is when. What is the timetable for the resurrection of our bodies? And the answer is, there is no timetable that we're privy to. God does have a timetable for the resurrection of our bodies, but it is in his top secret files. There is no access granted 
What we do have is every reason to be awaiting the resurrection with a sense of positive hope and anticipation. And why? Because the process has already started. It started with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And just as the first fruits imply a coming harvest, just as labor pains means a baby is on the way, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means the process that will climax and our resurrection has begun. That's part of the significance of Jesus' resurrection. It, it, it shows us that first burst of new growth. That's Jesus' resurrection. It's like a maternity ward. The graveyard becomes more like a field or like a maternity ward awaiting its rebirth. So that's the when. Fourth answer, fourth question is this, who? I want to give a technical point and then a personal point. A technical point is this. Who is raised technically? Technically speaking, all people will be raised from the grave. All people will be raised from the grave. Let me just read to you Acts 24 and verse 15. And I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection. Now listen to this, 24:15 of both the righteous and the wicked. They'll both be raised, but there's something particular about the resurrection of Christians. And if you would, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Turn, turn to 1 Thessalonians. I want to show you something in particular about the resurrection of Christians. Let me, go, let me just read this first bullet point. Who is raised technically? All people. But there's something particular about the resurrection of Christians as opposed to those who reject Christ. That's the point if you're filling in. Who is raised te technically? All people, both the righteous and the wicked. But there's something particular about the, re the, the resurrection of Christians as opposed to those who reject Christ. And here we see it. 1 Thessalonians, beginning at verse 13. Brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. By the way, that passage tells us positively it's okay to grieve over people who died. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Why? Verse 14. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. There's the resurrection. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And here's how it's going to happen. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left at the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That is, those who are already dead. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ, that is, those who died in a saving relationship with Christ, will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we, the dead who died in the Lord, and those who are still alive at the coming of the Lord, will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. You see, what is, that? what is that hope? It's the confident expectation that those who are in Christ, when we are resurrected, we will be transformed into glorious bodies. We'll be raised forever to be with the Lord. Um, one kind of resurrection will be to a new creation. We'll mention that next week, uh, life everlasting. You'll see what that's like next week. The other, though, will be an eternity of, of misery. There'll be those who, who Jesus said, said, Lord, Lord, did we not do this, 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 and this? Jesus said, depart from me. And he talks about a place of outer darkness, of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That will be what happens to those who reject Christ. So that leads us to the personal point. 
And the personal point is this. That's the second bullet point. For every person on this planet, it's either life with Jesus or life apart from God and under his judgment. That's it for every person on this planet. No one ever stated the, the, it better to me than C.S. Lewis. He, what, what he says here is truly, I, I'm amazed at just how profound C.S. Lewis was. Listen to what he says. And think about this next time you talk with the person in the produce department at Kroger or you talk to the mechanic at Bob Boyd or someplace or something like that. Listen to this. It is a serious thing. This is from the essay, The Weight of Glory by C.S. Lewis. I quote, It is a serious thing to live in a society of people and to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to, you can probably come up with a list there, may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, that is in eternity, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else the horror and corruption such as you now meet would be like in a nightmare. In other words, the most uninteresting person in eternity will either be so transformed and so glowing because that person is in Christ that you'd be tempted to worship them, send them on earth, or you would recall in horror. It'd be the worst thing you've ever seen in your life. Then Lewis says all day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one of those destinations. Good call for evangelism there. It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. All friendships, all love, all play, all politics. Now listen to this line. There are no ordinary people. And you have never talked to a mere mortal. Isn't that something? When you think about the interactions you have with people, it is true. Everyone is going to either be transformed and live a life with Jesus, transformed into something so luminous and glorious we'd be tempted to worship, Everyone's going to be in a place of abject horror. It's terrible. Everyone must make a personal choice. Ignore the gospel and your condition apart from the gospel. That's no better than a patient ignoring a very serious diagnosis from their doctor or putting off a decision about that diagnosis to a better time, whatever that would look like, or we can decide to follow Jesus and take our place in the Apostles' Creed along with the cast of characters that include God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and Mary. By the way, we are captured in that first person pronoun. Very first word of the Apostles' Creed, I. And then we are invited to believe. Think about that. First two words, I, we're captured in that, believe. That's what we're called to do. See, Christianity isn't about what must be done. It's about what has been done. It's not a story about our path to God. It is a story about God's path to us. And what we're invited to do is to believe and entrust ourselves to what God has done for us in Christ and trust ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ. That way, when the resurrection happens, and it will happen for everyone, it will be a glorious, transformative resurrection. And you will be, well, we can't even, we can't even know how glorious it will be, but we do know it will be glorious. Next week, we're going to take a look at the life everlasting. What is everlasting life going to be like? 
We're going to be sitting around on clouds playing harps. What are we going to be doing? Playing golf all the time? Just what is life everlasting going to be like? And then we're going to see what we mean when we say at the end of hymns, at the end of the Apostles' Creed, what do we mean when we say amen? Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, that is, um, that is something that we know happened, and it is, it is the first fruit of a great resurrection to come. Lord, we, we thank you that uh, when we do visit cemeteries, which we do more and more often, these days, that we're not visiting a place where bodies are, are disposed of. We're visiting a seed plot. And from that plot, people will one day rise, some to a glorious destination, some to a fate so horribly horrible, wrong, that, we would be, that it would just scare us to death. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that there is a resurrection to come, that this is not the end, that we will be raised in glorious bodies, and that one day, Lord, that we will be with you, and there is nothing better. Lord, help us to believe, to believe what has been done for us, to believe that you have made a path to us from heaven to earth. And that path, that way, is Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to make sure that our total trust and belief is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we know when that happens that we will be raised, immortal, glorious. And Lord, help us to remember tomorrow when we interact with people, we're not dealing with an ordinary human being. We're dealing with someone who's either going to be glorious or horrific. Lord, help us to see people in their eternal state and to deal with them with all the, 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 the wonder and the urgency that that demands. Lord, we pray you'll be with us this remainder of this week as we prepare for Lord's Day and for the good time uh, this Sunday afternoon with the crawfish bowl. We pray, God, you'll give us a safe passage home tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.